Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, before Hal Taylor starts his presentation before Penn, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, Delaware River Greenway Partnership. Uh, Delaware River Greenway Partnership seeks to engage the public and private partners to promote stewardship of the wild and scenic Lower Delaware River and tributaries. We work to preserve, promote, and protect the river. Our activities are centered on the region of the Delaware Water Gap through the upper estuary. And we are also the federally designated, uh, sorry, we're the host organization for the federally designated Delaware River Scenic Byway. And thank you everyone for joining. You could put your questions in the question answer or chat and we will answer questions afterwards. And uh, without further ado, uh, Hal Taylor and before Penn. Thank you so much, Hal. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Cindy. I certainly do appreciate it. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Thanks uh, very much for tuning in tonight. Um, <clears throat> I hope this will be a, an interesting uh, evening for you. I'll try to try to make it that way. Anyway, so uh, the story here is before Penn. Um, and we don't realize that uh, a lot of stuff uh, came along uh, <clears throat> European-wise before um, before the revolution. A lot of people think that uh, the uh, Mayflower uh, landed and uh, everybody got off and then there was a uh, revolution. Uh, but a lot happened uh, uh, before that and much of it doesn't get taught in the schools. So let's uh, get started here and uh, we'll see uh, how we came to be here in the first place. And one of the big reasons is because of, uh, let's see now, I'm not being, oh, there we go. It's because of this stuff um, as spices. Um, back in the days of the Romans, they were uh, just in love with spices. They were, they loved everything about them. They were, they were, they loved the fragrance. Uh, they especially liked the fact that they were expensive because they could uh, show them off. They were status symbols, more or less. Uh, it wasn't so much to preserve their their foodstuffs. They already knew how to do that. Uh, there was, the, you know, there was the status. Well, to get the uh, get the spices, uh, a lot of people were involved with it. Uh, for example, like uh, cloves grew at, on, a, on a small island in Indonesia, and just on one island. Uh, so they were pretty, it was pretty exclusive. Um, and they were, uh, they were harvested and they were brought over this network of, uh, of roots that uh, collectively were known as the Silk Road. Well, it wasn't just silk, obviously. It was uh, a lot of other things. You had all your, your spices. And, uh, there were other things that uh, uh, people coveted uh, in, the, uh, in the West. Uh, so it was a very lucrative business, but uh, a lot, it, it tra went through a lot of different hands to get to, to somewhere in, uh, in Europe, say. Um, so that's what made it so expensive. Now, what happened was uh, this was all well and good until the rise of the Ottoman Empire in the uh, 1500s, um, and they cut off a lot of these roots. So it made it really difficult. Uh, they, they still trickled through a little bit, but uh, this very lucrative business had been cut off, so to, more or less. So that you could say that that more or less caused the dawn of the age of discovery. Uh, we know about uh, Columbus and his escapades and how he thought he had, he had reached uh, India or China and um, was totally convinced of that fact till the, the day he died. But we know that, uh, you know, he went the right way, but he just didn't go far enough. Um, so there were other people uh, that uh, tried that as well. Um, so that was uh, 1492. Uh, just uh, five years later, um, having trouble advancing this right now. Hold on, let me try. Oh, there we go. Alrighty, um, so uh, 
we have a gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Giovanni Caboto, and he, you may also know him as uh, John Cabot. Um, he was a contemporary of Columbus, and Columbus may have known him. We, we're not sure about that. Um, he tried the same uh, approach as Columbus. He uh, went to the, the Spanish um, to try and get them to, uh, to back an adventure, uh, a, 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 an exploratory adventure to try and find uh, his way to the Far East. Um, but they turned him down. They weren't happy with uh, what Columbus did for them, obviously. Um, they, yeah, he didn't do what they expected him to do. So uh, he went to the English and the English uh, provided him with a ship called the Matthew and backing. So he sailed across the uh, North Atlantic and found his way to Newfoundland, now known as Newfoundland in uh, 1497 and planted the flag of the English and claimed everything <laughs> within his sight for the English and the stuff he couldn't see as well. So uh, that was a, a pretty audacious claim. Now that same year, uh, Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese uh, explorer also set out and he went the opposite way. He, went, he sailed south around the southern tip of Africa and across the Indian Ocean and actually made his way to India and to the treasures of the Far East. So uh, it, was, uh, it was much more successful, obviously, than Kaboto, or was he? Because Kaboto uh, found a land where nobody knew what was going on there. They knew that there were native peoples there, but they didn't know what else was going on. So, um, I need to advance to the next, uh, there we go. Um, and, um, <clears throat> all right, we got a little ahead of things here. Okay, um, all right, I can get to this now. Uh, all right, one second here. All right, let me collect my thoughts here, my deep thoughts. All right, um, um, Da Gama found his way to uh, India. And um, so, uh, the, since he was Portuguese, obviously they got involved with the uh, spice trade. So we had a, a, a trade route open now, a water bound trade route. Um, and um, so the Spanish got involved with that too. They knew about this. They followed the same routes. Nobody could stop them. So they sort of bickered with the Portuguese about who was going to take control of the, of the spices, the spice trade and the, uh, the silk trade. Uh, but eventually the uh, Spanish had to give up because of uh, their debacle, the, the uh, Spanish Armada, and uh, it greatly weakened the, uh, their economy and their, their whole source of, uh, of uh, revenue. So uh, this left an opening for the Dutch. Okay, hey, good, good move. Um, uh, and so they took over the spice trade and um, set up uh, in 1602, they set up the, uh, um, the Dutch East India Company. I don't know if you can see this up here. Uh, mine's a little, uh, I don't know how your Dutch is, but at the top of this slide, you can see uh, what uh, is some, some Dutch language there. And that means Dutch East India Company. So they took over the spice trade and did very well. Uh, in 1602, they started that. And within a couple of years, they were worth about $7 trillion, which is a, a lot of spice, I'll tell you. Um, <clears throat> so they, uh, they were, you know, highly, luc highly lucrative trade for them, but still they wanted a bit more because it took a long time for that, for any of their ships to get to the, uh, to the Spice Islands, to uh, any of these other stops that they made in the Far East, and then make their way back to Europe. So uh, there was the, uh, uh, there was uh, the weather, you know, terrible storms, uh, pirates, and then of course the Kraken. So they hired this gentleman 
by the name of Henry Hudson, who was an English navigator. And um, he had come from a family of navigators, uh, actually. So he was convinced that he could find a way through North America and uh, a, a waterway. He could find a waterway and make it through and uh, hop out on the other side of the North American continent. And, uh, and there would be China waiting for him. Um, and uh, there were all kinds of, of crazy tales about, uh, you know, how you could get to, uh, how you could get to the Far East from, from the West at that particular time. Uh, many of them came from the map makers. Um, <clears throat> so it was, uh, it was pretty difficult because nobody actually knew where they were going. In fact, they weren't even sure the size of the planet at that point. So um, Hudson set out and uh, he, he uh, explored all along the, um, the eastern seaboard, the, the northeastern seaboard. And he came to the Delaware River, what an opening, well, he didn't know it was the Delaware at the time, but he came to an opening there and he sailed into it in, um, in, July, in uh, August 28th of uh, 1609. And um, he entered the, uh, the Delaware Bay. Now the Delaware Bay is, uh, is well known for uh, shoals in the middle of the bay. And uh, Henry Hudson was probably one of the first people to find out about them because he immediately got stuck on one on a sandbar. But fortunately for him, uh, during the night, a storm blew in and was able to lift his ship called the Half Moon off and he decided uh, at that point that the Delaware Bay did not have much potential as a, as a passage through the continent. And he went back out into the ocean, sailed up north and into another bay, which we now know as New York Bay, sailed up the, uh, the Hudson River. He didn't know it was the Hudson River at the time, but uh, sailed up there and, um, um, until he, that looked very promising to him. Uh, and he also noticed that the, uh, the native peoples that he saw along the way were wearing these uh, beautiful furs. And uh, he was very impressed by that. And he thought, wow, these would go over really good in, uh, in Europe. So he kept that in mind and kept in mind uh, the other things that he saw along the way. So he uh, found out uh, eventually that as the, uh, as the Hudson River became more and more narrow that this was another dead end for him. So he sailed out, went back to, uh, uh, to Amsterdam uh, to tell his backers and uh, the people in charge there that uh, this was not uh, a real successful uh, voyage as far as finding a passage through the North American continent, but he did find a lot of potential there, a lot for economical reasons. Um, one of them being the beaver, which was highly valued in Europe um, because, of, uh, because of the fur, obviously, because of the, uh, the pelt of the beaver. It was, uh, it was used for a, a variety of purposes. It was very, very versatile. They used it for all kinds of stuff but especially for those outrageous hats that they used to wear uh, with the really, really wide, wide brims. Uh, it would take about eight beaver pelts to make one of those, one of those crazy hats. So uh, it was a very valuable commodity. Uh, the beaver was pretty much extinct in Europe by that time, it had been hunted that way. Um, so a little sideline here, a little side point is that, uh, a uh, gentleman by the name of uh, um, uh, Samuel Argall, one year after, uh, after, uh, after Hudson sailed into the Delaware Bay, um, almost to the day, it was uh, August 27th, that Argall entered the Delaware Bay. And he was another navigator, a, another English navigator. And he was working for this guy, whoop, Hold on here, I missed something. He was working for this guy right here, uh, who was the first governor of Virginia. And he had just arrived 
uh, and, and Jamestown to try and salvage that, uh, that uh, colony, which was on the verge of extinction. They had not done well. And he was uh, Thomas West, the Baron de Delaware. That was his title, the Baron Delaware. Um, so um, uh, Argal uh, found his way into that bay because he was on a foraging expedition because uh, as we have just uh, been told by myself, that um, the uh, colony there at uh, Jamestown was not doing too good. They were on the verge of uh, starvation and were just ready to leave when, uh, when, uh, when the Baron Delaware arrived to help them. So he was out on this foraging expedition, got blown off course and found himself in the Delaware Bay. So uh, to save, uh, to save the expedition, um, he, uh, he thought he would appease the boss and uh, name the bay after him. So he named it uh, the uh, Delaware Bay. Of course, it was not used, that name was not used immediately. It went through a series of names. So uh, just a little sidelight, I thought you would get a kick out of that. All right, um, back to the Dutch. Uh, they were very pleased with uh, with what uh, uh, Hudson had told them about the uh, about the commodities and the natural resources to be found in in the New World, so uh, they what they did was they set up uh, the New Netherland Company and sent uh, a bunch more explorers over, and by about 1615, um, they were sailing up the Delaware Bay, uh, Delaware Bay and Delaware River exploring as they went along uh, each and every little waterway that they found, every tributary, uh, they would uh, sail around and uh, look for uh, look for commodities, uh, stuff that could be sent back to, uh, to Holland uh, to make some money because they were, that was their main purpose, make money. <coughs> so they claimed this, uh, this parcel of land that they called New Netherland and it, it uh, ran from the uh, Connecticut River down to the Delaware River. Uh, how far inland, nobody knew at this point. So they, uh, they met the, uh, the native peoples there, uh, the uh, Lenape. And the Lenape lived all along the river, all the way up uh, into uh, New York State. And they were, uh, they called this whole region, uh, the whole Delaware River Valley, Lenape Hoking, and they called the river Wihitak. And there were uh, a number of numerous tribes, and they were divided into sub sub tribes and uh, little communities. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second, lubrication here. Um. And uh, they were, you know, they've been living here for thousands of years. They were a, a Stone Age people. Uh, so when the uh, when the Dutch uh, met them and started uh, bargaining with them for furs, uh, their their goods were something that uh, astounded the Lenape. Uh, can you imagine uh, using um, implements made out of nothing but bone and stone? For your whole life, and then somebody shows you a metal knife, uh, it'd be mind blowing. Uh, so that's exactly what they did. Was uh, the uh, the uh, Lenape were so impressed that it was uh, easy to start a trade business. So they became uh, trading partners, uh, business associates, and the Lenape uh, had a very you know a simple life. The the men, for the most part, were foragers. They went out and uh, and hunted, and uh, the women uh, were the agriculturists of the communities, and they had a very unique way of uh, of growing their crops, which you may know, may or may not know about. This goes back thousands of years, obviously. Uh, they lived uh, mostly on uh, corn and beans and squash, so they had this unique uh, technique that they used. They would plant corn, and as the corn grew, they would 
plant beans around the base and the corn would act as a trellis for the, for the beans to grow on. And then around the, uh, the beans, they would plant uh, the squash and the squash plants had big leaves that would uh, keep the shade uh, on, the, uh, on the roots and keep uh, moisture in the soil. And the uh, Lenape called this the three sisters. Now, um, by this time, the Dutch were pretty well established globally uh, to accompany the East India Company. They now created the West India Company, uh, which uh, to right off the bat was not quite as successful as the East India Company, but uh, they had a lot of uh, purpose in mind. Uh, they set up uh, sugar plantations in uh, South America and in the Caribbean and in Africa. They, uh, <coughs> they uh, set up uh, mineral uh, mines, looking uh, copper, especially gold, always looking for gold. Uh, and then uh, they had, unfortunately, what, we, what they referred to as black gold, which was the slave trade because they needed people to work the plantations in the new world. So that became also a lucrative business. They didn't care about morals or whatever. They were there to make money and that was it. And also they had the fur trade, which was going great guns in New Netherland. Now, <clears throat> while this was going on, there was a gentleman that worked for the, uh, the, the West India Company and his name was Peter Minwe. And you may have heard of him, you may not, I don't know, but he volunteered to work for the company. Now you have to remember that this enterprise was not colonization so much. This wasn't for uh, people looking for freedom in the new world. They, no, this was totally a financial venture uh, from, this, from the get-go, from the beginning to end. It was all about finances. Um, so Peter Minwe was put to work as an explorer and he knew after a while, he knew quite a bit about the Delaware River because he was looking for uh, minerals, anything of, of value that could be exported back to, uh, back to the Netherlands. <coughs> gold, always looking for gold, of course. And he did quite well worked his way up the corporate ladder, so to speak. And um, before long, he was made the, uh, the director of New Netherland. Notice I said director rather than governor, because once again, this is a business and it's run like, like a business. So he was the director. And um, uh, he was pretty successful at that, uh, organizing and trying to get along with the uh, Indians, which was, which was rather tough at times because uh, the Dutch were a little impatient with them and were not familiar with the ways of the Lenape. So often there were, there were disputes and uh, revenge would be taken on, uh, on the people there, on the settlers. Um, so uh, he decided uh, to smooth things over and uh, he initiated what was probably the most lopsided real estate deal in history when he bought Manhattan Island from the Indians for um, the equivalent of about $24. So uh, you can't park in Manhattan for $24 now. So it was, uh, it was quite a bargain. So um, he, he did well, he did well for himself, but uh, there was a lot of backbiting going on and accusations uh, soon came to the surface uh, that uh, he was not doing a good job. Uh, we don't know if that's actually true or not. For the most part, some say he did, some say he didn't, but anyway, he ran afoul of what was going on. And uh, uh, back, in the, uh, back in Amsterdam, uh, they got wind of it. And so uh, he was called back there. He was called back to Am Amsterdam and he was removed from office, which disturbed him to no end. He was quite shocked at it actually. Um, <clears throat> but he was not the only one 
who was upset by this deal. Uh, there were other members, in fact, founding members of the East India Comp West India Company, excuse me. Uh, and they were disgruntled as well and decided to do something about it. And they were gonna start their own business. So they needed backing and where did they go? They went to Sweden. Uh, because Sweden was a very powerful nation during this time. Uh, this was not the I IKEA uh, people that we know today. Um, these were uh, pretty ruthless people uh, because of their, their king, uh, Gustavus Adolphus, who was known as the Lion of the North. And, uh, you know, went on the, uh, uh, the uh, he became a basically a scourge of the uh, of the northern territories there, and just started uh, grabbing territory. Um, uh, <clears throat> so he was uh, successful at it, and he was approached by uh, by the people of uh, of the of the uh, West India Company, the me former members, and um, he was open to their suggestion, their ideas of starting a new enterprise in the new world. And uh, he, he decided to back it. And unfortunately, he was killed in battle. Uh, he was a very uh, offense-minded king and probably one, of the, probably one of the last kings to be killed in battle actually in uh, 1632 during the Thirty Years' War. <clears throat> so, what happened next was uh, now his daughter became the queen of Sweden, but she was only about nine years old. So she really couldn't get involved in the act too much. But there were other people that took over and uh, still uh, maintained that idea of uh, starting a new business. So it was to be a joint Dutch and Swedish venture into the new world. Um, a, a trading venture, basically, for the most part. And they would call it Niesvergia, which is New Sweden. And because of uh, Minwi's knowledge of what was going on on the Delaware River, that's where they were going to put it. So uh, Minwi was in charge of outfitting this, uh, this venture. So he bought a couple of ships one of them being the Kalmar Nickel. And there is a, a wonderful, wonderful reproduction of this ship that uh, sails out of uh, Wilmington. In fact, uh, they built this, uh, this ship, this reproduction in the, in the late 90s. And uh, it's, uh, they've actually created a foundation, a, uh, a nonprofit agency that uh, has grown up uh, around this, this ship. And it's, uh, they do a lot of uh, teaching. So the ship itself is like a floating cla class classroom. Uh, plus their uh, facility in Wilmington is a, a beautiful building. Um, and they have all kinds of, uh, of activities there for students and for uh, adults as well. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. So, and a beautiful ship. If you ever get a chance to sail on it, they do uh, you know, public sails uh, when they're in Wilmington and when they're in uh, Newcastle. So you might want to check that out. It's a great thing. So uh, they got this uh, expedition outfitted and uh, left Amsterdam in uh, 1637. Uh, had some hiccups, uh, you know, some little problems. Had to get the ships repaired. Um, and uh, so finally they got underway <clears throat> and sailed across the, the dark, gloomy Atlantic and found their way into the Delaware River in 1638. Sailed up the river. However, they did not make, uh, they did not land on the Delaware River. That's not what uh, Minwe had in mind. Uh, he was very clever and where he was going to place their facility, their, their, uh, their, uh, <clears throat> their uh, what do you want to call it? Their, uh, their starting point here, their, their home base. Um, he sailed into a tributary called the Minquaskill, and it had been 
it would have been named earlier by the Dutch. Uh, Kill means a river, of course. Uh, and Minquas was named after the Indian tribe who were, uh, who were close by and inhabitants of that area. So uh, he sailed up the Minquas Kill and uh, built a fort and he called it Fort Christina. And he renamed the name, the river, the, um, the Christina River. And this was to be their, their outpost there. And very cleverly, he was just out of reach of the Dutch. The Dutch, Dutch's border, their, their border uh, was, the, uh, was the, the banks of the Delaware River. But, uh, but uh, cleverly, uh, Minwe put it just put them just out of reach. So now he was free to uh, to start uh, trading with the Minquas Indians for the the fur trade, mostly beaver, because uh, they came down from the Susquehanna Valley and brought their furs with them, and uh, so it was very easy to get to the Dutch to uh, the Swedes uh, rather than to the Dutch because they would have to cross the river to get to them. But here they had very easy access. So it was good trading for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Dutch complained about it. They sent nasty letters and uh, which were ignored, of course. So let's move along here. And uh, there's, there's some of the minquas bringing their furs down in the, the misty morn on the, uh, on the river. Now, um, in 1643, uh, well, let me back up here a little bit. Um, Peter Minwe uh, was going to be the director and the, the leader of this expedition, of course. Um, so he had to return to uh, Amsterdam and he was going to get more people, but he stopped at the, uh, in the Caribbean on his way back. And he went to visit uh, a friendly captain on another ship and a storm blew in, a very large storm, and he was swept out to sea and nobody ever saw him again. So they sent a new, uh, a new governor for uh, New Sweden, uh, a man by the name of Ritter. Um, uh, I think it was Johan Ritter. I don't know if I have his first name correct, but anyway, Ritter. Uh, and he didn't do such a great job. So uh, in 1643, uh, this gentleman uh, arrived. Uh, and all his uh, splendor, all his 400 pounds, Johann Prince, uh, a mountain of a man, um, a Dutch, another Dutch explorer, uh, David de Vries de de described him as being a man of brave thighs. The uh, Indians uh, got a big kick out of him. They called him Big Belly, and the uh, English referred to him as Round John behind his back. And uh, he, he, his personality was as, as big as his frame. Uh, he was arrogant, uh, had a short temper, was hard-headed, um, liked to uh, bully people around, uh, but uh, was uh, known to be a pretty good administrator. Um, so that's what he did. Uh, he started out with a long list of, uh, of projects that he was supposed to get involved with that the uh, Swedes had, had handed him. <clears throat> um, so uh, one of the things he did first was he tried to fortify the, uh, the uh, entire uh, region of uh, New Sweden. So um, when he landed at uh, Fort Christina, he brought his whole family with him, his wife and five daughters. Uh, so he thought it was not a, a good, uh, good place for them. So he wanted something a little bit more refined. So he built a, uh, a, a governor's mansion on, uh, at Tinicum, which uh, you may or may not know about, which uh, was, was further up on the Delaware River, uh, just south of the uh, airport. Um, and uh, so he also built a small fort there. He built a, a small uh, outpost on the uh, Schuylkill River. And then further downriver, on the Delaware, about where the uh, Salem nuclear plant is now, he built uh, another fort and he called it uh, 
Fort, uh, Mike, uh, Fort uh, um, uh, El Elfsborg. But the uh, soldiers stationed there called it another name, uh, Meigenburg, which meant uh, Fort Mosquito. Now, um, being the organization that you are, <clears throat> many of you will know that uh, along the uh, wetlands uh, of the river, um, there are many creatures, many flying creatures, and all of them bite. And this was uh, exactly the case with these mosquitoes. And they were so bad that these soldiers stationed there looked like they had some kind of diseases. They were uh, pockmarked with uh, mosquito bites. And it was just so horrendous that they had to abandon the fort. They actually could not live there anymore. So uh, that was the end of that. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look here and see what, where we're at at this point. So here's a little map showing what's, what's going on in case you've been confused uh, wandering through this, this presentation. Um, the orange part that you see uh, far to your far right is New England uh, and then comprises what are, you know, what are now the New England states, of course. You see Plymouth there and uh, Long Island. And then in the uh, outline in green is New Netherland. And you can see uh, it, uh, it's bordered by the Connecticut River and the Hudson River is right in the middle. And, uh, and then its Western uh, border is the Del Delaware River. And in uh, royal blue, uh, you can see we just have a little area there and that's New Sweden. And then uh, down to there, to the south of them, of course, was English again. Uh, that was the uh, Lord Baltimore's uh, colony of uh, Maryland. So uh, that'll give you an idea of uh, what it looked like at this point. So you knew that there was bound to be some problems there with three different uh, nations involved in, in this whole region. And then, of course, you had the Native Americans, or uh, I hate to use that term Native Americans, because actually, if you were born in this country, you are a Native American. Um, and actually, I've talked to certain, uh, you know, uh, indigenous people, and they they don't mind being called Indians. Um, and they've pointed out to me that, well, you were if you're born here, you're Native American anyway. So I don't want to get into any more semantics. So we'll move along here now. About this time, um, the Dutch were having their share of problems. And um, their former governor uh, did not get along well with the, with the Indians. In fact, he was actually provoking them, more or less. So uh, it was a, a constant struggle with them. Rather than uh, uh, trying to you know, continue their role as business partners, they, uh, they wanted to control the Indians. They, they wanted to control their every move and the Indians did not like that. So uh, that, that governor was kicked out and uh, Peter Stuyvesant was brought in. And he was pretty much the counterpart of uh, Johann Prince, also stubborn, uh, hard-headed, very hard to get along with, short fuse. And um, so he was faced with a dilemma. He had the English pressing uh, on him from his, the northern part of his territory. Um, and uh, so that's one of the reasons why we have Wall Street today. He built a wall around uh, New Amsterdam so to keep the English out. <coughs> and then he was dealing with the, uh, the Swedes to his south who were stealing the fur trade from him. So at, uh, at this point, he decided uh, to show some muscle. So he picked on the, the weaker of the two opponents, which was the Swedes, of course. And uh, he put a, a flotilla together and uh, sailed up the Delaware River uh, with a big show of strength. Uh, they uh, would blow a lot of horns and shoot off their cannons uh, to let the Swedes know that they were there and we're, we're gonna be uh, taking over. So he uh, found a, a very prominent uh, location on the Delaware River and built Fort Casimir. 
So now he's outflanking the Swedes because the Swedes had a, uh, a relatively you know, small but uh, uh, substantial trade uh, route there down, down the river. So now he, he was basically cutting that off from them. <laughs> and they were further up on the, uh, still up on the Christina River. Um, so uh, Stuyvesant left and uh, left a small contingent of men there to, uh, to keep things in order. Um, the problem was that uh, he didn't really leave enough men uh, because uh, they had all they could do to try and maintain the fort. It was built right next to the river and it's just made out of wood and earth. And within a short period of time, it started to deteriorate very badly. Uh, there was also a small village that started to grow uh, around the, and behind the fort uh, that was called New Amstel. And uh, that's where uh, some families were, some of the soldiers brought their families there. Um, and, and there it was uh, for a while um, until, let me see where we're at here. Uh, excuse me, just a second. Um, but um, as I have said, um, the fort started to deteriorate. There were not very many men there. And in, uh, <clears throat> during this time, the uh, uh, Governor Prince was starting to get a little tired of what was going on. He had been here for, for 10 years in 1654, uh, 53. Uh, he had been there for 10 years and he was not getting uh, much done. Uh, there was not, uh, he hasn't, wasn't accomplishing very much. The, um, the, he kept asking for more colonists over the, the time that he was there. And sometimes years would go by and he would not hear from, from, from Sweden because there were wars going on there still. It was, it was Europe was always at war, you could count on that. Uh, and so uh, as a result, the colony uh, suffered uh, because there was not enough people to get things done. So he was tired, he wanted to go home. And in 1653, uh, he left. And the following year, um, he was replaced by another uh, governor named Riesing, Johann Riesing. So Riesing uh, arrived and he sailed up the Delaware and he came to Fort Casimir. And as uh, the protocol of the day was, he uh, fired a, um, a salute from one of his cannons. Uh, and at this point, the fort was supposed to return the salute, return fire. Uh, it was friendly fire, of course. Um, and they waited and they waited and they didn't hear anything and nothing was going on. And then before long, a, uh, a boat came out with some men in it from the fort and they sailed up to the ship and they said, uh, uh, we're very sorry, we cannot return the salute because we're out of powder. We borrow some powder from you so we can return your salute. Uh, and Riesing thought about it for a minute. He said, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll send some over. So he thought about it and he thought, what is going on there? So um, he's <clears throat> put, he himself and others got in a couple of longboats, uh, sailed ashore and uh, walked into Fort Casimir. And they find that uh, there's only a few men there. And true to the soldier's word, there was no powder. In fact, there was very little ammunition. So uh, in a, a bold move, Yo Johann Riesing said, Gentlemen, this fort is now ours. It belongs to the Swedes. And he changed the name to Fort Trinity. Well, Stuyvesant got wind of this eventually and was absolutely furious. So he uh, gathered as much force as he could. It took him nearly a year. So in 1655, he put another flotilla together and sailed up the Delaware River once more, uh, blowing horns and firing off cannons. And as you can see, they sailed by old Fort Elfsborg, which was 
in ruins by this time, abandoned and in ruins. And they sailed up and they came to, uh, to Fort Casimir, which, was, which had become Fort Trinity, and um, gave the ultimatum, surrender. Uh, well, the Swedes didn't have too many men either at that point. And they, they saw that they were totally outgunned uh, and out, <clears throat> outmanned. So of course they surrendered. Well, the flotilla continued upriver and uh, until they came to the Christina River and set about uh, setting up a siege and uh, told the people there in charge, okay, uh, it's time to surrender. Uh, you're uh, totally out, out maneuvered here. Um, there's nothing you can do, and uh, but the uh, the inhabitants of uh, of Fort Christina said, "Well, well, can't we just talk about this a little bit?" So um, about five days went by, and there were talks, and uh, so a, a lot of beer barrels were emptied, and a lot of uh, brandy uh, disposed of, and wine, and so finally they came to the agreement. Okay, we'll capitulate. And then uh, that was the end of New Sweden. So it was a bloodless coup, so to speak, a bloodless takeover. Um, so now uh, Stuyvesant was faced with yet another dilemma. Uh, okay, he had put an end to New Sweden, but what did he do with these all these people? He did not have enough, for, enough forces to occupy the territory. So what he did was he just told the people, well, look, um, we'll give you an option. Uh, you can leave. I can give you passage back to Sweden or wherever you want to go. Or you can just stay here and uh, pledge your allegiance to the, uh, the, um, the West India Company. And most of them decided to stay because these people had begun to put down roots now. They were had become farmers, most of them. <coughs> uh, the land was good and why leave it? So but um, Stuyvesant had to hightail it back to New York because now the Indians were riled up uh, and they were, uh, they were threatening to get rid of all the colonists up there. So he had to go back up to uh, New York and take, uh, well, New, New Netherland, excuse me, and uh, take care of business there. So he really couldn't uh, spend too much time and negotiate there. So uh, the Swedes and uh, Whoever else was down here got the, got the best of the, of the deal. They got to stay where they were. And it was like a, a new boss, same as the old boss. So about this time, um, the two brothers, the uh, uh, Charles II, King of England, and his brother James, Duke of York, also known as Dismal Jimmy, um, had been watching what was going on and decided it was time for the big takeover. And they were, had been threatening to take over New Netherland for quite some time, <clears throat> which is what they did. So uh, the king put his brother in charge and the Duke uh, sent some ships into, uh, the, the, uh, into New Amsterdam Harbor and demanded the surrender uh, that they were going to take over. Well, Stuyvesant, being the man he was, was furious and stomped around on his peg leg and uh, had a fit and a conniption and said, no, we'll never, we'll never surrender. But uh, cooler heads prevailed and he was talked into it and eventually he, uh, he let it be. And uh, New Amsterdam became New York. And, uh, in October of 1664. So then the, uh, the English sent their ships down to the Delaware Bay and the Delaware River because uh, this uh, village had grown up around uh, uh, Fort Casimir and uh, New Amstel was getting larger and uh, a lot of business was uh, being conducted there. And so the English said that they had to take that over as well. Well, by this time, the man who was in charge of all this, uh, the Dutch, Dutch governor of this, 
of, uh, of uh, New Amstel uh, was a man named Alexander Hinosa. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was thought very highly of himself. In fact, the people that living there called him the little prince. And uh, he overstepped his bounds uh, greatly and said, no, we're not gonna surrender our fort much like Stuyvesant. But uh, the English uh, would not hear of it. And they said, well, really, you're not going to do that? And he said, no, no, never, never. So they said, very well then. And uh, they opened fire and it was all over in about 40 minutes. And uh, as a result, about 10 Dutch uh, soldiers were killed and uh, a few others were wounded. And this was the only time that blood had been spilled on the Delaware between uh, Europeans. Quite remarkable, considering that uh, of uh, all that had been going on here, all the uh, back and forth activities between these different nations. So uh, Fort Casimir was uh, was damaged a bit, and uh, and so this all became uh, New England. Uh, 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 no, excuse me, not New England, but uh, England. Um, and uh, from Maine all the way down to Georgia was now uh, English territory, the whole Eastern seaboard. Meanwhile, in uh, England, a, uh, a religious movement had been, uh, been afoot and it was started by a gentleman by the name of, uh, of George Fox. And one of his young followers was a man by the name of William Penn. And William Penn was a, a very wealthy young man because his father was Admiral Sir William Penn, uh, who made a lot of money. He was the top man in the English Navy. So William went to all the finest schools in the, uh, in the area, in, the, in the London, uh, wore fine clothes. Uh, very interestingly, uh, he, had, he had gotten smallpox when he was younger. And uh, so uh, unlike uh, the Quakers who were, that took everything at face value, uh, he wore a wig for the rest of his life because that was a result of the uh, of smallpox. He became, he became bald, um, but uh, he sort of had a foot in both world of the uh, commercial world and in the, the world of the, uh, of the Quakers. The Quakers believed that all men were absolutely equal you did not bow down to anybody that wasn't necessary. Uh, they didn't, their church, so to speak, um, did not have any ministers. Uh, everybody uh, uh, to, it was involved uh, equally in what was going on. And of course the English hated them for that. Um, they were greatly persecuted at, uh, at one time. It was actually illegal, it was against the law to be a Quaker. Um, so uh, they were uh, they went through some uh, absolutely tough times, um, and in the meantime, uh, George Fox said, "Well, there's, maybe there's something we can do here." He heard of uh, settlements in the in the New World, so he decided to go there on his own, and um, with an Indian guide or several Indian guides, he uh, he traveled through the New World for, for, from Virginia and uh, through the Delaware Valley and up into New England and back again, and uh, finally made his way back to England and um, uh, reported to, uh, to William Penn what he had found there. And Penn got very, very excited. And, uh, so um, this all ties in with uh, what was going on, You've, you may wonder, why do we have a map of New Jersey here? Uh, and how, what does that have to do with William Penn? Well, uh, here's how it, how it ties in. Uh, in 1664, when uh, the English took over most of the East Coast, um, the, uh, they had all this uh, territory that they had to do something with and had to belong to somebody, um, even though the Dutch and Swedes were Still living there, it had to uh, had to have uh, you know an official an official nomen uh, there. So um, what they did was they divided the uh, the province of New Jersey, which they originally called 
Nova Caesarea, uh, and they divided it between two friends of the royal family, uh, John Lord Berkeley and uh, George Carteret, Sir George Carteret, who had been uh, instrumental in uh, taking care of these two brothers while they were in exile because their father had been executed. So they had to get out of the country or harm would befall them as well. So these two gentlemen had uh, taken, um, taken care of them. So as a reward, they divided this province of New Jersey between the two of them, Berkeley having West Jersey and Carteret getting East Jersey. Now, this is a strange configuration that you see here. Uh, New Jersey was divided in a number of different ways throughout uh, between this period of 1664 and 1702. And this is just, this is just one of them. Uh, and, and you would think, well, why did they divide it on such a, a strange angle? And uh, I, I can't answer that, I don't know. But anyway, uh, here's, where, here's where William Penn comes into play. Um, William Penn had heard about, uh, you know, because of, of George Fox's uh, um, uh, <clears throat> adventures in the New World, he um, he got the thinking that uh, the 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 Quakers should have a, a a refuge, a place where they could they could go and practice their their religion without being in trouble all the time. Um, so he was greatly interested in this, and. Um, because of his, his father, uh, you know, he, uh, he had this, a great deal of money. So what happened was that uh, Berkeley decided to sell his half of New Jersey, and he was going to sell it for a thousand pounds. So here comes a very complicated real estate deal um, called the Quintapartheid deal. And um, so Berkeley's share of New Jersey was sold to a gentleman named Billinge, but Billinge didn't have the money for it. So a man named Fenwick, John Fenwick, uh, and th these were both Quakers. Fenwick uh, took the, uh, uh, was uh, held it in, in trust for Billinge. Billinge. Um, so that, uh, and he had to put up some of his own money as well. So um, eventually it, it was, uh, it couldn't work out this deal. Um, Fenwick couldn't afford it. Bill and still didn't have the money. So what happened was the money went to William Penn and his business associates. Um, so uh, William Penn by this time had become quite a real estate tycoon. So he bought uh, bought it from them. Uh, it was uh, it was very complicated. It went through the courts for quite a while. So uh, William Penn became the owner of West Jersey. Then Carteret sold, and William Penn also became the owner of Carteret's share. So he owned all of New Jersey at this point. Also. Uh, and this is the biggest point of all, is that um, William Penn's father died and the king owed him a great deal of back pay, a, a lot of money. So William Penn said, well, in, in lieu of, uh, of that back pay, I would like some land in the new world. <laughs> so uh, the king said, well, sure. And that's, that's how they paid off a lot of their debts anyway was, uh, well, you know, we owe these guys some money. Well, oh, here, um, here, have some uh, land in, in the new world. Um, they didn't really know what was over here to begin with, how much land there was. So they would just give them a piece of land. And that was the case with uh, William Penn. So he was, uh, he was given Pennsylvania, as we know now, and became the proud owner of uh, 46,000 square miles of, uh, of land and uh, called it, of course, Pennsylvania. He was the uh, largest individual landowner in the world at that time. So he sailed um, 
to, uh, to the New World in 1682. And um, he arrived at uh, Newcastle, which had formerly been the, uh, the village of New Amstel. And that included uh, Dutch, Swedes, English, slaves, free men, Scots, Irish, you name it. It was a, a mishmash, uh, much, like, much like New York uh, had, had also become. So um, they were, everybody was on hand there to greet him. Um, very happy to welcome uh, William Penn. Um, so uh, he went into, uh, landed at Newcastle. He got off and um, <clears throat> performed a, a small ceremony, uh, a small in individual ceremony all by himself in which he claimed this, this whole area, a very solemn affair. And then uh, that same day, he moved on in his ship, the, uh, the Welcome, and sailed up river to, uh, to an older uh, village, uh, a, a Swedish village that was called Upland and um, landed there. And that's where he planned uh, to put Philadelphia, his, his uh, golden city um, that was to be the, uh, the main attraction of his, uh, his uh, holy experiment, what he called it. Um, the problem was that uh, nobody wanted to sell any property to him. Uh, so uh, he couldn't make them, of course. So uh, he just said, huh, well, now what do we do? He says, okay. So they sailed further up a river. And, uh, and in the meantime, the upland became Chester, Pennsylvania. So he sailed up river uh, and found another good spot uh, where people were already settled. And, um, and that's where Philadelphia was going to be. There was this house there that was called the Slate Roof House and William Penn would rent that. Um, and there was, uh, there was also the Blue Anchor Tavern was there. Uh, Swedes had small, uh, a small settlement there. The uh, Indians uh, were still living there. There was a, uh, a shipway which, uh, where, where uh, ships could be hauled up and repaired. Uh, and there were any uh, number of uh, small businesses there. So he, uh, it wasn't a place where uh, uh, nobody lived, it was virgin territory. Uh, there were already people there. So uh, William Penn uh, arrived and uh, stepped off the boat, uh, had, a, uh, had a beer in the, uh, in the tavern there. And uh, he set about making himself at home. Uh, he had some other people with him and started laying out uh, plans for Philadelphia. Um, and uh, remarkably, uh, there were so many things that have been touched by William Penn in this area, mostly name wise. Uh, no matter where you look, you can't stumble over something that isn't named for him. But uh, oddly enough, he only lived here in the Delaware Valley for four years. Um, he lived uh, at the Slate House. He also had a governor's mansion built. 26 miles up river uh, that's, uh, uh, that was called uh, Pensbury Manor. And that has been uh, rebuilt and is quite, quite an interesting place. I highly recommend a visit there if you ever get the chance. Um, so that's about uh, where we are now. Um, it didn't all end there. Of course, we had the, uh, the episode where he, uh, he bought the land in good faith from the Indians at uh, uh, Shacham Shacamaxon, uh, the uh, Indian village that was there under the, uh, the Penn Treaty Elm. So he's, uh, he is greatly remembered in this area. Now, as you can see, it was a long period of time before William Penn arrived. It was uh, 60 some years. My, my, my math is probably is quite horrible, but uh, it was, it, it was quite a long period of time from the first settlers that, uh, that arrived here until the arrival of William Penn. And then keep in mind that it was nearly a hundred years after he arrived that the revolution started. So um, quite a bit of history uh, took place. So that's about all I have for you right now. I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. Um, 
And if you liked it, uh, you can uh, you can buy my book, William uh, the Before Pen, and it's it's on my website, which you can see there on screen. And uh, I have a, a number of other books as well, all pertaining to history, mostly of uh, the Delaware Valley. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for putting up with me this evening, allowing me to come into your homes, into your office space. Okay, so uh, I will turn it back over to Cindy and see if there's any questions. Yes, thank you, Hal. Really enjoyed your illustrations and the history. Uh, we do have a question. How did okay. women fit into this period? Oh, there were no women. That's it. No, no women at all. No. Sure answer. Um, <laughs> um, as you can imagine at this, at this point, um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm almost correct in that um, th when the Swedes came over, uh, there were no women. Uh, the, the, first, uh, the first couple of, uh, of voyages to the New World did not include any women. Gradually, there were some women, but very few. And they had to do just as much work as the men. It was, it was brutal. I mean, you're starting from scratch in, in a new world. So uh, it, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, a leisure time. They were, they were brought over, uh, you know, as potential wives if they weren't married already. Um, and, and that was their role. And it was just uh, gradually uh, more women did come over as, as uh, the colonies got bigger. But uh, their, their roles were, you know, subdued, uh, so to speak, because uh, there was just such an amount of backbreaking work to be done. Um, and that's, that's the part they played. They worked just as hard as the men. Wonderful. Uh, are there any other questions? Anything at all? <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, you mentioned Shack and Moxon, and I, I stumbled across that street once, and I was looking up the history. Apparently, they uh, there was a, an important tree that uh, there is a um, I don't know what you want to call it uh, memorial to it, or or whatever you want to call it that's uh, in that area. So it was it was kind of an important area to them. Oh yes, yes, that was the uh, the Penn Treaty Elm. Um, yeah, uh, and the tree uh, uh, was not forgotten. Uh, the tree uh, eventually fell down during a storm and um, uh, pieces of it were used to make uh, furniture. In fact, um, Abraham Lincoln had a desk that was made from, uh, from the Penn Treaty Elm. And uh, 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 not acorns, but uh, what, what they call scions, which were little pieces uh, from the tree that were uh, rooted. Um, uh, new trees were sprouted from, uh, from the old tree. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, Haverford College has some of the, the trees on it. One of, one of the local colleges, uh, very interesting. Very neat. Yeah, I didn't know that part. Yeah. So yeah, there's a couple of thank yous coming in. I'm not getting... Any additional questions? Well, I guess I covered everything. <laughs> you covered it and, and everybody understood it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, Hal. Thank you, everybody who joined us. We had a, a wonderful turnout, all thanks to you. And I hope you all have a good night. Thank you very much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you again. And Take care. Okay, bye-bye.